Good to see you both. You're both looking in fine form. Brad, let's just, well, this place must bring back a few memories actually, especially this part of London, thinking back to maybe yeah. six years ago. I did say this morning we were doing something, but it's probably not the only memory I have of the Olympic time trial that came past here was coming out that roundabout at Kingston Bridge and it funneling down to sort of four or five abreast and just the noise when I accelerated out of that corner um, was something I'll never forget, it was amazing, yeah. And that's kind of, you know, the only vivid memory I have of that time drop that came around here, so. Let's go back to the beginning, and I don't mean the beginning of the collaboration to do Wiggins with Lacole, but the beginning of your relationship together. How long, Yanto, have you known each other? Um, 21 years, 1997. <laughs> Uh, and I think it was the Tamworth two day, if I remember right, uh, in around August or September '97, where I first met Brad. And um, yeah, it was we were very young and a long time ago now. We didn't know half as much as we did. Was Yanto any good, Brad? <laughs> he was really good, actually. It was um, obviously you won't remember how cycling was. That it isn't like it is now. What was it like? There was no money. There was no equipment. You know, as juniors, we pretty much. Well, beg, borrowed, and steal off people. And Yanto was from the same. I think it was from the same town as Jeremy Hunt, who rode for Benesto at that time. And he'd always turn up at races with all hand-me-downs. He had Benesto leg warmers, Benesto arm warmers, and all these stuff off Jeremy Hunt that we were all dead jealous of. And um, yeah, it was just it was like I say a different time. Yanto got tenth at the Junior World that we rode um, when Mark Scanlon won, and he was his bike must have weighed twelve kilos at that time. It was a Colin Lewis bike. And again, just completely different, and as I say, he just, um, he was, he was actually, yeah, he was really good, I'll he won't say that, but he, he kind of missed the boat a bit, because I was on the track programme, and there was no pathway through if you were just a road rider then, not like there is now. Um, so he went off and did the usual, went to France for a couple of years, and was probably on the verge of turning professional, had he been French at that time, he would have ended up in a professional team, but being British, it kind of used to go against people, so. I think of Benesto, was that when Indurain was on Benesto as well? He just, he just left actually, I think yeah. Jez joined the year that Indurain retired. One of your heroes of course. Yeah, but Alano and all those guys were there when he was, when he was there. But, then, then what about racing together? I mean, so you sort of went your separate ways, but then in latter years, I know you, went, you spent a good time, a good portion of your time in France, you came back, you were a bit disenfranchised with cycling, weren't you, the pro world, but then you got back into it. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, as juniors we raced together and we found ourselves um, quite often one of us or both of us team leaders in the 98 junior season doing World Cups all around the world um, with the GB team. And, um, and then, yeah, we, we definitely separated in our career paths. And, um, yeah, I realised that 25, I wasn't going to earn the money that I needed to to, I don't know, buy food properties and live off the rentals. Uh, so I thought I'd better think about another plan, and that was starting a business. But really, we talked about this. Sorry, we have been through about 15 different interviews this morning, if we keep referencing this morning. Um, uh, just talking about the fact that I have actually learned a lot of the commercial challenges, which has meant by the time Brad's come along, we started this partnership, you know, that my business is has learned a lot, has grown a lot, and is able to now really fulfill the full potential of what a collaboration can achieve and that's actually really exciting. So that hard work back then, starting the idea in 2008, starting making products in 2009, and then being commercially viable as a business in 2011, has all part, uh, paved the way for the work that we're doing now and the, the real scale that we can achieve. How did he broach the question, Brad, of doing a, a Wiggins collaboration? Uh, should I tell the truth? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes please, the truth. Um, so we were, we were the back of the, Peloton and the Tour of Britain, I think in 2000, uh, 2013 or 2014, I think it was 2013, so five years ago, and he said, what are you doing with them champagne sprays, Rafa or something, and I said, um, <laughs> uh, I said uh, he said, you're not a Rafa athlete, you know, you're not a Rafa, you know, come on, we need to do something in the future. So this to me as well before, right? and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, he really hates them, doesn't he? Just a, a year after that, I was looking at doing my own uh, breakaway clothing anyway, you know, aside from Rafa and that. And uh, you know Fred Perry and all that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, and he said, well, you know, so we were kind of, I, I, I sort of, we put it off for a couple of years. He actually saw my first lookbook of designs that I'd done years ago that I and really liked them. And 
and just kept in touch like that really and it was I think at the end of last year or midway through this time last year we started talking again about because um, I, I didn't feel like I was already with Rafa last year with Team Wiggins and I thought it was too much red tape they sold the business as well and I just didn't see their future in, in me doing my own line of stuff so it was a bit of timing and everything really but and obviously yeah, so agreed to do the, the team as well which was a big part of what we're doing so kind of went from there how did you feel when it happened I got did you start spraying yeah. champagne around I bet you did yeah, didn't yeah you? I did so um, you might actually know this because as people may not know Matt and I ride together every now and again if we you ride on my wheel <laughs> Um, no, but so it took quite a long time to get through the process. You know, we were very diligent about it, and Brad's got a management team who, you know, analyse all his options and assess what's best for him commercially, which is absolutely right. And um, I was really keen to do the deal because, like Brad said, I'd seen his lookbook already, and we do know each other, and there's been, you know, there's quite a lot of history in, in our relationship. But um, he's a big commercial deal, and he has to go through certain processes, and. Um, when we actually signed the head of terms on the contract, which was, I think, Friday before Christmas, which was like the day before Christmas Eve, uh, I, I only then began to talk about it openly um, because I kept it very close to myself. Um, partly because I was just nervous it wouldn't happen. I didn't want to then have to then explain to everybody, oh yeah, that deal I was talking about. So literally, very close friends of mine went, oh, I didn't realize you were doing that. And I'm like, yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't know it was gonna happen then, but I do now, so. I'm in a really good place. And, you know, actually it's moved on to, it's probably better than I could have hoped it would have been. Um, because obviously, I mean, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but I would always look to the future and think and assess how good can this be and how will our partnership work out and how will the design process happen? You know, will it be good, will it be strong, will it be difficult, will we disagree, will we get on? You know, all of these things, there's a huge amount of unknown. Um, but I'm really glad that we've done it and it's really been a positive experience. Well, let's talk about the designs because you can see them all here and there's uh, women's uh, jerseys as well over there and bib shorts too. Um, how did it come about? Are these, are these all from the lookbooks you'd originally sort of thought um, up or what, what was the collaborative process between the two of you? Well, I think I had, I had loads of ideas anyway that I, um, I had in my head already, particular colourways and stuff. And, one of the jerseys actually designed the one in the middle there. This one. The, yeah, that one's actually based on a jersey designer team my dad wrote for in the eighties. Oh yeah. Bossisio, and I took the um, design from that. So there, there's quite a lot of sort of self indulgence for me anyway, in terms of like um, things that I've liked in the past yeah. that I wanted to incorporate in, and it's certainly a nod to kind of the heritage of cycling, and in a time when cycling jerseys were um, quite plain, they didn't have a lot of sponsors to think about, particularly in the sort of 60s, 70s, and um, you know, we didn't have to think about six or seven sponsors, so it's kind of keeping that, but putting a modern kind of take on it all, and, and the whole sort of gold thing that's running through it, which is kind of, for me, the whole Olympic thing. Yeah. Definitely, that's kind of a, something we kept through, but then I just send all this stuff to Yanto, kind of colorways, things I like, things I see, posters, and they kind of try and make sense of it or put it into a context of what a design would look like or what would sell, what wouldn't sell, or stuff we might save further down the line. So. There's definitely a nod to your love of mod, isn't there? Well, I just think... I think the, the colourways. Colour there's just definitely, um, definitely heritage within cycling. There's a British sort of theme running through the whole thing. Um, one of the jerseys as well, I got the ideas from, there's a film called Escape to Victory, where Pele scores an overhead kick. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who remembers. So Stallone, Bobby in it, and all yeah. these people, and, and they wear this kit, they get given this kit, which yeah. has got like a Steve McQueen stripe down one side, and I took that, moved the stripe into the middle and changed the colours, yeah. which is, I don't know where the jersey is, but it. Well, the grey and green one there. Uh, I don't know, wherever it is, somewhere. We've just got here, so I'm not ready to look around, but. <laughs> so, so that jersey, anyway. Go shopping afterwards, there's um, plenty of stuff you might like. Um, <laughs> I could certainly imagine Paul Weller wearing this kind of stuff, definitely definitely in these colours. But actually, cycling informed mod rather than mod informing cycling, isn't that, isn't that the way? No. Okay. No, I've got nothing to do with mod. I'm obsessed with mod. I have a bit. I have a bit. That's, just, that's, just how, that's how I see it. The, the colourways just remind me of that. Well, sort I think of thing. That, that's all, it's all taken from 60s, 70s, 80s yeah. cycling jerseys. You know, 
the wiggings across the thing now. So that from you know, in terms of it being then stitched in, I had an old jersey from a team called Salvarani. It was Felice Gimondi's jersey, and they used to have the Salvarani across the across the, the, um, the arm. Yeah. So I, I kind of like that. I like the fact it's stitched in, so you're not going to lose a G or an I in the wash. Let's be honest. When you're at home, when you're putting your Sunday best on, you don't want the stuff to fall off. You don't want it to start peeling off when you when you've only had it five minutes. It's all about the look, isn't it? Well. That's what, that's what Geraint Thomas told me once, it's all about No, I, mean, I think the money you spend on this these days, so I mean, you don't want it falling to bits, so, yeah. It was easy to work with. It's actually very good, yeah. Uh, I don't know um, what I was expecting beforehand, but it's been a... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not just saying this because he's sat next to me, but genuinely, and Andrea, who's the designer, just behind the post there, um, it's done a great job as well to make our job easy. So uh, I have said this before this morning that there's kind of three people in this relationship and we all occupy a specific space. And the reason why it works so well is I don't you know, upset Brad's ideas and rhythms and stuff and um, you know, style that he wants to implement. And then I translate that to Andrea. She does the detail. She gives us heaps of options to choose from, which, which to be honest, are all really, really good. And then we try and reduce them down a little bit, and then I take that, what we've reduced down, and give back to Brad and say, is this kind of there or thereabouts? Which one do you prefer? You know, can only pick three of these. And I just send him a message, but a four letter word beginning with S, ending with T. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it's easy collaboration. Really easy process. Yeah, All on yeah. the WhatsApp group. But because we've known each other since we were juniors, I know that means great, and I just carry on and do it anyway. <laughs> Uh, and you enjoy the riding at the moment? Yeah, no, I've really rekindled really my love for cycling, yeah. which took a while actually, but not, not because of anything, it's just because I got so bored of it that towards the end it becomes such a chore. Um, always riding to power and all that sort of stuff. And it, it's just nice, it's nice to be kind of realise why I got into cycling in the first place. And uh, I think part of this process was quite a quite therapeutic in many ways. I've, you know, I've also got another book coming out at the end of the year with all the other stuff that I own of other people's. Yeah. So it's just been a bit of a nostalgia trip for me in terms of like kind of realizing why I started cycling 25 years ago. It's great to hear and I look forward to seeing that book because you do have tons of stuff, I mean, tons of amazing bikes and jerseys. And yeah, I've, been, I've had that stuff since I started when I was 18, so. Yeah, I've got more of Eddie Merckx's race-worn jerseys than he has now. <laughs> I, I had to go to him to get the zoom forward for this book and show him all this stuff that he didn't know I had. And um, yeah, it's just I feel like I'm kind of a bit responsible to collate all that stuff for a museum in the future. And you know, I think it's part of the fabric of the sport and everything. Definitely, yeah. and I think everyone knows just how much you respect it, and you know, you're steeped in it, aren't you? Listen. You can ask a few questions in a minute, but I have some here. I'm not just fiddling with my phone, I have some here on email. From the fans, what is your typical daily training diet? And I, I guess this means when you're, when you're racing, right? Yeah. And the most unhealthy food or drink you have eaten during training? Specific question. Well, yeah, I think when you're in professional cycling, you try and eat as little as possible when you're not doing a lot because weight is such an issue and paranoia of putting weight on is it dictates your life and dominates it i mean it's just to ridiculous levels you know of kind of coming back from six hours and just having a salad and then trying trying not to eat the rest of the night you know and um at a particular moment you know particular times of the season um, obviously when you're on a race you can tend to just eat to appetite because you're racing hard, you're expending that much energy, you're always traveling and you tend not to put weight on through a race, but it's when you come home from a race and you have a few days off and all that sort of stuff and all the wives tales that used to go around cycling of don't eat, when we were in France, don't eat fromage blanc because it blocks your Checks. legs, don't eat ice cream, blocks your legs. turn the air con off in each room to give you a cold and all this sort of stuff and it's kind of, um, yeah, just, it's, it's, I think it's the biggest thing within cycling is, is weight and constant it's just a constant thing you think about i know you did a lot of training in Mallorca, and i heard a story you can confirm or deny this that you would on a sunday you would go out and do a long ride mm. then you catch a flight back to manchester and you wouldn't eat until you got home is that right uh on specific days we'd try and do calorie deficit rides which were like seven hours on basically on no food but you can't you can't go over a certain power when you're doing that because otherwise you just blow up but creating enough of a deficit calorie wise to to lose weight, so yeah, it was all horrible. 
It was horrible, yeah. And you get in such a mood and a strop of everyone around you. By well, 12 o'clock, your, your brain's fizzing because it needs sugar and stuff. But then you just go to sleep and wake up the next day and you can eat again. And, and I think it's like the lifestyle you adopt, and most of them adopt to, in order to, to do what they do. It just goes with it. It comes hand in hand with cycling. Unfortunately, unfortunately, whichever way you look at it. I think that's the bit about cycling which you can't communicate. You can't actually... So we're both retired, and my wife will testify that I'm definitely a much better person to have around the house now I don't do those rides or do this back-to-back -back six hours a day and um, just generally in a much, much better mood, which when you've been there for 20 years, you kind of don't realise that you're, you're down here all the time. A little bit grumpy, a little bit intolerant, a little bit like, just leave me alone. And, uh, and then you come out, come out of that after 20 years and realise I don't need to do 25, 30 hours a week. And um, I'm actually quite a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what explains your moves during the Tour of Britain last year? Uh, <laughs> next question. This footage going around, Brad, of you falling off when doing some cross-training with a French team in the early noughties. You put it up yourself, actually. Are you considering challenging Tom Pidcock anytime no, soon? No. Did you ever like cross? No, I hated it. Uh, anything where you have to get off your bike and jump. Get all. muddy? No, it's not so much the mud stuff. It's just, I, I tried it once at Eastway in the mid-90s. I used to have a big supercross there. And just the minute I tried to jump off or run up steps and all that, it's just, you know, it's impressive what they do when you see it in the flesh, how quick they are in transition and stuff, but no. Uh, what, Brad, was your hardest training session leading up to the Tour de France in 2012? Probably, we used to do uh, a loop in Tenerife where we used to go training, which is at altitude. And it was 250k and it was about eight hours, this thing, but there was about five, six thousand metres of climbing in it. Um, we, we used to do that loop, so you go one down one side of the volcano, around the island and up the other. And um, it was always the last ride we did at the end of the camp before we flew home and then did the race. So it was kind of, they still do that ride today, Froome and everyone. And Final question. What do you think, what is your the race that you're most proud of winning, your achievement, your proudest achievement, and also, what was your favourite? Because I wonder if they're two yeah, different things. Yeah, I think the one that came past here, actually, the time trial in 2012, was without doubt, you know, just the opportunity to do that. Not many people get to do the Olympics anyway, but to do it in your hometown of London, um, in front of that many people, it, on, the, on a day like that, that was it was pretty special, that. And even mm -hmm. today, you know, we rode over a bit of the course last weekend, which was, for the first time since then, actually, and uh, and I like my childhood hero followed me that day in the car in Sean Yates, and uh, so to have him with me through that journey and doing that was it was amazing. It, you know, it was the reason I got into cycling was because I watched Sean take the yellow jersey in the Tour in '94, and I used to have an earring when I was 14, and I wanted to be Sean Yates, and, yeah. you know, and so to have him there in the car with me that day and. Um, he got, yeah, he'd, he'd got the train up from where he lives to Victoria yeah. and got ridden across from Victoria to here to do the Olympic time trial with me you know? and then went back home afterwards and just just how you know those sort of things happen in other countries. So to do that here was, was amazing. Yeah. And with Sean being Brad's style icon, it means the bib shorts that he's just released are like hot pants. They're really, <laughs> really, 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 really by, right? Like he used to wear, not really. Well, I did have this discussion with Yanto. And we've kind of settled somewhere in between. <laughs> well, weird. actually, I, um, I haven't told you this, but Sean bought a pair of shorts off me and I made them specifically for him. And he took extra small and added 12 centimeters. Yeah, he's gone to back to actually having long shorts now yeah, and long think, socks. So. so when Brad references oh. Sean's short shorts, I'm like, what are you talking about? It's They're from long. the 90s. So. He's moved to Spain now as well, hasn't he? Yes, Sean, yeah, just yeah. recently. Yeah. yeah. But he's got two incredibly talented sons who you know one of yeah. on your on your team, of course. Okay. What I wanted to ask you, Brad, is. That's not the first time there's been a random appearance from you in a club level kind of thing like that. W what motivates you to do that? Not least in the year that you're set to win the Tour de France. Why? why I just think um, I think more than ever now, cycling the void once again in sport the void between the elite and the club cyclists has grown again, mm -hmm. and there's this massive void between now and and sort of gone are the days where the closeness between <laughs> the general public or cycling clubs and professionals um, like that, you know, just, you know, there's not many sports where you can turn up at a club 10 or 
or, or a chain gang and ride with the elite. You know, I think you know Alex Dowsett still comes back and does time trials in this country, and you, see, you can go and race against Alex Dowsett on a, on a Tuesday night, which I think is brilliant, because you couldn't go and have a kick around the park with Harry Kane. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you couldn't. So I just think that's wonderful. You know, and I think I started through the club system, so it's always still there. I still go out with. I don't go out with the Mer uh, go up to Liverpool Mercury, you know, and. Um, I went out last Wednesday with all the old guys, okay. and uh, one another guy that I saw with the Tour of Britain in 1987 has just come back to the sport in Joey McLaughlin, whoever remembers Joey yeah, McLaughlin. Yeah. And I went out with him last Wednesday, and okay. we go out on a Sunday and a Wednesday from Bickerstaff Church still. And um, it's just brilliant that you can, you know, you can still go and do that. And Phil Thomas comes out with us, who was a British champion as well. And so we've got quite a good little group of riders there. That, that all go out that still love just riding bikes to the cafe and stuff, which I think is a big part of it. It's the social side of it that I've sort of really found my love for, which is, you know, you, you, you can tend to forget about that when you're kind of in the, in the, in the sort of pressure cooker of everything else you're trying to do. Sure. Quick question from you. Hey, right. Uh, so Brad, you know um, York inside out. I'm 72, 100 kilos, and the only thing I seem to be able to do better than most people in the past is downhill short segments. Yeah. Which is the best and safest downhill sector on the island? On this side? In. On, in Mallorca. Oh, in Mallorca? Yeah. Probably the one from the petrol station at the top of Look back down to Poyenza, which yeah. I think is the, the sort of straightest mm. run of. Well, home. the one where you come round and it goes straight down the hill and it's dead straight and then it goes and it's gone out to the upper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cold as <laughs> <the front. laughs> <laughs> Um, the one that goes from look to Polenza, <laughs> the one that goes down. Yeah, I guess it's called Nicky Love something, it's about 26 seconds. Yeah, well, I think that's the best one yeah. anyway, definitely. Yeah. I think it's the coldest Should I get a bigger ring then? Because I'm using 5034. So if, if, you go, if you get the trajectory right in the corner, you shouldn't have to pedal down that one. It's quite a um, kind of, you hit top speed and you oh, almost well. don't matter what chain ring you've got on really, kind of, it's, it's the, Take away, well, take the bends down that that kind of create the speed that you then hold into. So. Get an aero tuck, I think so. Aero? Aero tuck. Yeah, right. Yeah, so Brian, is that what you're going to say? Are you still a fan of the tour and the Grand Tour? Yeah, I mean, I still watch them and, and yeah. more so. I perhaps didn't watch them as much last year, but um, this year definitely. And I've always watched the classics, I never really stopped. Boonen's last sort of reign in the classics last year, and then. You know, there's certain individuals that you turn on the telly to watch, and at the moment in cycling, Peter Sagan's one of them. Um, Who are you backing this year for the tilt? I think, I think, well, no, based on the Giro, obviously, Chris has to be favourite. Yeah. Based on the way he finished the Giro. Yeah. Um, in some ways, uh, had he not got off the, the thing with South Utamore, then I would have said Brian Thomas, but he may have to play second fiddle now to to Chris, um, but I quite Did like to see, to maybe yeah, you just never know with him as, how they're going to be, I'd quite like to see Roman Bardet win, from a French point of view, I think it'd be fantastic <coughs> for French cycling if, if someone like, and he's a pretty cool guy and he kind of, again, he, in the future he will kind of, not, it'd be similar to Sagan in that he's actually got a personality and stuff, which is quite good. In <laughs> G, G, G's in phenomenal form, isn't he? National yeah. time trial champion, of course. Yeah. Um, just hope he stays on, that's the thing. You know? Yeah, it's, it's the trouble with Grant. He's, he'll either have a bad crash or he'll have a really bad day because he can go so deep and do so much damage that he just then doesn't recover. Sort of France isn't about being exceptional on one day to be bad in 95%, like Chris was really in the Giro, you know, just there or thereabouts, constantly and consistent. I think that's what G always been G's down for, but obviously he's in his 30s now, he's got a lot more experience. I think he could really, really be his year, you know? Oh, definitely, it was fantastic. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right, Richard here. Um, so I was a track cyclist and an individual pursuiter as a junior. Mm. Um, I got back into racing on the track and I'm gonna to attempt to the hour record for a 50 year old next year. Any advice? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first things first is you obviously go and have a go at the distance uh, for um, probably 15 minutes. I think that's the first the first thing we did is we said, okay, what's what's this going to take? So we went to Manchester and we rode for 15 minutes at pace or as close to pace as possible on the equipment we had at that time. 
and kind of get an idea of what, what that feels like and what it's about. And then from that, you know, you, we had, a, I think we set out a six, six to seven week training program where we did three sessions a week and working on, we probably, most of the time, 10, 15K blocks at that pace. So we never went more than half an hour at that kind of, just because of the mental side of it, you just can't, just, you can only, well, I, I only had one one hour in me. It wasn't going to be something I did twice. So. I was there when you did it. Yeah, so it's, um, it's definitely, yeah, I mean, if you obviously, you know, if you know, if you're confident that you can break it, it's just continuing to work towards that pace, really, in shorter blocks and getting used to what it's about. I, the way I did it was break it down into five 12 minute blocks. So I knew the first 12 minutes was going to be relatively easy because it was something you can sustain for an hour. I knew the last 12 minutes was going to be horrendous and probably never going to want to go back there. And probably you can only go there once in your life because it's that hard. So I left 36 minutes in the middle to get my head round. Um, and I found that an easier way. So I just count 12 minute blocks down. Um, just something to break it down. What was going through your mind when you were doing it? Um, I, can't, I can't remember a lot about it, to be honest. No, I mean, you just, because you're so focused, it's not something you remember vividly. And obviously, because it's 220 odd laps, you, one lap turns into another. And the, the thing I do remember about it was um, getting really hard after half an hour and then just sort of coming round maybe 17 minutes to go and thinking, 17 minutes to go, you know, in five minutes you're only going to have 12 minutes to go. Just think happy, you know, and then trying to like, give yourself hope. <laughs> um, and, and coming around, you know, not, I think, right, I'm not going to look at the clock this time when I come around. I'm going to leave it and, and, and do three or four laps without looking at the clock and go, God, that must be a couple of minutes. And then look up, there's only like a minute just gone. <laughs> so it's just it's, it's horrendous. And that builds and builds and builds and builds until you get to like seven minutes to go. And it, everything's hurting. The saddle's getting excruciating, you know. You, and I just and you're dropping off the pace, you know. And, and you, but then you're thinking, okay, in six seven minutes I can have a beer or whatever, and that's it. And just just you know, you're thinking how you're gonna. I always think in those moments how you're gonna feel when it's finished. Just think of that feeling, you know, kind of. So that that's kind of what gets you through or got me through most things at hard moments like that. When you hear that, it's no surprise that no one's tried to take the record off him yet. <laughs> I think it's going to last what, for a while. I mean, it's lasted, what, how long is it now? No, I, I still, I, it was one of those things I wasn't that satisfied with it. I was glad I did it and I got it over, but with the weather went against us that day and pressure and stuff, yeah. and I'd hoped, I'd hoped to go beyond 55, which I'd have been really satisfied with to get close to running his record. But it's still a good record, but I think it's breakable. And I think someone like Garine, someone like Tom Dumoulin, definitely can break it if they put their minds to it and maybe went to altitude or a different track or something. So yeah, for sure. I think it, it's there to be broken. I, in some ways, I hope it does get broken. You know, you don't want this thing to now lay dormant for 20 years like Baldwin's did, you like know? Did, yeah. for, for, the, for sport, for cycling, it would be fantastic if someone else does go and break it. And the beauty with the hour record, you're always on the list and you know, you you broke the hour record and that's it. So I hope one of them do break it. Yes, sir. You talked about your love of the classics. Would you swap uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I said that this morning. I said I'd swap at least two Olympic golds for a Paris Roubaix. Yeah, for one race, you know, I think it, it's just magical. You know, it really is. So. Did you need to do more of it? You had that big crack at the end of your career with your. Career yeah, it, yeah, it's just timing. I mean, you can't do everything. Do you know what I mean, my other big ambition in life was to go to moonwalk, but I just <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it. You know, some things you have to accept. You know, that your heart wants to do something, but to, to win something like that, you know, everything has to come right. And in some ways, I almost wish I'd maybe carried on for a couple more years because you know you think maybe your time is up, and then and then Matt Heyman went and won it yeah. after you know like see a Roubaix a race like that where you can really. You may not have to be the strongest that day, but just be in the right place at the right time. And so, but it is what it is. And I was happy to have been in the top ten and and, and can just come onto that velodrome really because yeah. yeah. He went up with a broken elbow as well. Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty yeah. good. Uh, right. Um, when you were a um, child and you were doing races, um, did you feel like you were going to be an Olympic cyclist when you were older? Uh, yeah, I did actually. Um, in my head, when I was 12, that's all I wanted to do. Um, so I watched Chris Borman win the Olympics in 1992, 12. 
And, um... <laughs> and, uh... You can ask a couple. <laughs> they bore your, they bore your shirt. <laughs> It's just, it's it's just goes to show anyone could do your job. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Heyman won Paris Roubaix with a broken elbow. Just point that out again. Um, so yeah, I, I watched Chris Borden win the Olympics when I was 12. How old are you now? I'm nine. Nine. So it's a little bit older than you. And he won on this real space age bicycle called the Lotus Bike at the time, which was, you know, was revolutionary at the time. And, uh, it was on the front of every newspaper the next day that he won on this bike and I was 12 and I was playing for West Ham at the time in the youth team and I just thought, this is what I want to do with myself and I said to my mum, I'd love to do that one day and I was growing up, and cycling wasn't like it is now, we didn't really have a lot of cycling shops and it wasn't that popular and we didn't have our superstars to look up to and so that was my inspiration and that's what I wanted to do. So from that moment on, in my head, I didn't want to do anything else. I went to school each day, but I didn't concentrate. I told my art teacher at school, she said, what are you going to do with yourself when you're older, Brad? And I said, I want to wear the yellow jersey in the Tour de France and I want to win an Olympic gold medal. Come on, don't be stupid. What do you really want to do? And that was the response I got. So it just shows you that if you've got a dream, you put your mind to something, you can achieve anything. So uh, yeah, that's it really. That was definitely what I wanted to do after that. But uh, what I wouldn't advise you to do is what I do, which my son holds me to all the time now when he gets in trouble at school, is I should have still concentrated and done my exams and all that. <laughs> <laughs> what if it didn't happen for me? You know? So uh, one thing I will say is you know, it's probably the stupidest thing I did was not concentrating at school after that. So. You've just spotted his dad filming this. Yeah. <laughs> Best question tonight, I think. Round of applause for that one. <laughs> Reminds me a little bit actually of a photo that Laura Trott, as she was called then, yeah. had with you at the Manchester Velodrome, I think. Yeah, yeah. And oh, that, the Athens Olympics, it was, yeah. That photo, you just think, well, she's going to go yeah. somewhere. Yeah, it just shows you, yeah. And I had similar photos like that with this guy called Tony Dorr. I had my photo taken with Tony Dorr when I was seven at Paddington Track. And I just live around the corner from there. And um, yeah, I mean, I actually, Chris Lee White as well, when he. <laughs> He won the milk race in 93, which was on Sky at that time. Don't be shy, Chris. And the milk race was hard. The, uh, the British Crit Champs in Crystal Palace um, that year, and I was 13, and I went, I rode up to watch, and I asked for his autograph and everything, and the other guys that were there at that time, and there was a guy called Spencer Wingrove who got a medal that night. It was good as well. So it just shows you, you know, you need those people to look up to because ultimately that's what gets you into cycling. You know. Yeah, had his photo taken with me when he was 34, and now he's on telly. <laughs> Good work, Yanto. It's not going to work on the, to work on the shirts, though. Yeah. Just, you know. Now I was able to start Team Wiggins, which is focusing on under-23s and grassroots and, and giving them guys a platform into the professional ranks and seeing them really develop and help. That, that would have never happened without the success. And also next year now, the goal, which I hope we're very close to securing, is to have a women's team that runs side by side. So, so we're doing the same with the women as well, which no one else is really doing, which I think they deserve. So, so all these things, it's just, you know, they're all part of the legacy of the success of 2012. And I thought that was really key. So I said to a few people back in 2012, it's like, what do you want your legacy to be? And it's that really, it's to inspire people or, or someone to say, actually, you know, we've got Owen Dorr in Sky, and he said, you know, he, he puts that down to the development he got through our team and um, Scott Davis at Dimension Data and these guys. So it, that's more of a real... all this technology, have you got more coming? So where is it going to take us? I, yeah, I could probably help answer that a little bit, just because that's kind of a commercial question. And we discussed this this morning uh, with some of the journalists around the experience we have on a bike is kind of really useful to have the confidence to go, that's just a gimmick or that's just marketing and actually this is real, this matters, this doesn't matter. Not just in the kit, but in the way you train, in what you eat, uh, understanding what you want to achieve and connecting that to the steps you need to take to get there and breaking that down into most fundamental steps that you need to do and then things that are actually, they don't really work, even if it, there's an article in the paper or you know, a cycling magazine that talks about it. It's having the understanding and the confidence to know this matters, this doesn't matter, distill that down and make it simple. And I think there is a lot of technology coming in that is still yet to be proven 
and we find that as a brand that we have to, I quite often am aware of new things happening all the time, and we delay the time we introduce it to the core range because actually it hasn't been proven and until I'm confident that it's right, then we won't introduce it. And sometimes that means uh, there's no kind of um, assurance that the technology will last or you know all sorts of different things. So um, yeah, I think making sure we're aware of it, but we make sure that what we introduce is working and is going to work and is going to benefit every rider, whatever level they're at. Right there. <laughs> Um, my, my son's 11 and uh, he's not a big cyclist, but he picked up a library book which is called Bellapedia. It's like a coffee table book, and what he loves is the history and the stories and the epic climbs and so on and so forth. He's captivated by it, and in Duran and some of the cyclists you've talked yeah. about, Brad. So, there's a question for you both, really. Is there a particular story that you that inspired you when you were that kind of age? You talked about some of the names, but were there stages or some of the stories that? I've probably got the shortest answer, so I'll go first. It's actually um, essential when we go through a design process within a collaboration like this that the, st the story is as strong as the product itself in terms of technically and functionally, and then the style, and it all has to connect up. So what you described there is something that I love as well, and when we're going through a design process, I need every single step along the way to say the same message, clearly, coherently, and then it to be delivered when you wear that jersey and you go for a ride. So the story is essential all the way through every stage and something that as a commercial part of the business that backs what brands bring to the table um, has to make sure it, it is educated and knowledgeable of all those stories back in the past. You, you never used to talk like this either when we were 18. <laughs> <laughs> it's turned into a cross between Dave Brailsford and Alan Sugar. <laughs> Fancy words, I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, Favourite story? I mean, there's so many, but I remember hearing a story once when I was younger about Tom Simpson and Eddie Merckx, and it was at Parry Nice. There was a uh, Eddie was a narrow pro, first year professional Parry Nice, and they both ended up up the road together. Eddie was in the yellow jersey, and Tom attacked him and won the stage, and eventually won Parry Nice. Um, and uh, this, this is someone, whoever reiterated the story to me, said to me that these two went up the road and Simpson turned around to Merckx on the road and said, young man, you will one day be in charge of this sport and have your day. And at that point, Simpson dropped him and went on to win Paris East and Merckx was left behind. I went to see Eddie a couple of months in April because he's done a forward for this book I've done and we asked him about this story and I said that story was amazing, you know, one person passed over to the other and he goes, oh, it didn't happen like that. <laughs> and he told me about himself, so what happened? He goes, he flipped me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just shows you just how stories, especially in cycling, get fed from generation to generation and twisted and more and more <laughs> and actually Eddie was the strongest set there and Simpson was begging him to stay with him. <laughs> Eddie punctured and because there's no TV cameras like there is now, 24 hour news cam Tom carried on, didn't wait for him. <laughs> so that was the story of that. But I just thought it was brilliant. It is brilliant. Um, for now though, I've been Matt Barbette, Yanto Barker and Sir Bradley Wiggins. Thank you very much.